Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week we've got a new species of Alvarez saurid dinosaur preserved in its sleeping position, a study showing that troodontids were largely plant eaters, a new species of dinosaur called gremlin, and much more. Starting off the news this week, a study published in the journal Nature Geoscience has found that water from the surface of Earth can penetrate and reach deep into our planet, affecting the geology of the planet deep underneath the Earth's crust. The study took a closer look at the boundary between the Earth's mantle and its outer core. This core mantle boundary has particular characteristics that have garnered the attention and interest of geologists in the past, particularly the layer known as the E prime layer, believed to exist at this boundary, which seems to have a much lower density than one would necessarily expect. The researchers did high pressure experiments on elements they expected to find at this level to see what might cause the chemical interactions that may explain the slightly odd properties of the E prime layer, eventually concluding that chemical exchange between the core and mantle facilitated by water from the surface traveling all the way through the earth over billions of years may have contributed to the formation of this layer. A really interesting study and a crucial addition to the research of the mysterious activities deep within our planet. And in other news, we'd just like to quickly mention the SpaceX Starship launch that we said might happen last week. The rocket launched at 1300 GMT on Saturday and was a better success than the last one, which saw both stages catastrophically explode shortly after launch. The first stage, the eventually reusable Super Heavy booster, separated without issue, but was then subject to what SpaceX liked to call rapid unscheduled disassembly. It blew up. The second stage, the Starship spacecraft, was seemingly unaffected by this however, and continued its journey until it unfortunately lost contact before reaching its target altitude. Excitingly, SpaceX say their next test flight could even be before Christmas, as the company eagerly tries to prepare the launch system for landing on the moon with NASA's Artemis program in either late 2025 or early 2026. Also in the news, a sperm whale sanctuary is to be set up off the island of Dominica. A population of 500 sperm whales consisting of around 35 families live in these waters which provide crucial nursing and feeding grounds. Unlike many other populations of sperm whales, they stay in the same area for much of their time. These endangered whales are at risk of harm due to being hit by ships, becoming entangled in fishing gear, and are affected by agricultural runoff. An 800 square kilometer area is to be protected, with only sustainable artisanal fishing being allowed to take place to prevent entanglement in fishing gear, and an international shipping lane will be delineated, to avoid more deaths of sperm whales from ship strikes. Sperm whales are known to defecate in surface waters, and their nutrient-rich faeces actually encourage plankton blooms, which in turn capture carbon, which is ultimately sequestered deep in the oceans when phytoplankton die, thus helping to mitigate climate change. Interestingly, for reasons that are unclear, these particular sperm whales are known to defecate a lot more than sperm whales living in other areas. So it is vital that these sperm whales are protected, and Dominica is being applauded in its efforts to safeguard these creatures for the well-being of both the marine environment and the climate. First up in the recent paleontology news, there's been a very cool new study cataloguing a wide range of sauropod bones from the late Jurassic Morrison formation of the US with bite marks inflicted by theropod dinosaurs. This survey of previously published bite marks as well as museum collections has shown that bite marks on large sauropod bones from this formation are generally underrepresented in the literature, and that bites on sauropods are actually more common than previously realised. The exact identities of the individual bite trace makers cannot be determined for sure, as there are multiple different candidates for what could have been biting these sauropods in the Morrison formation, including Allosaurus, Sauropaganax, Ceratosaurus, Torvosaurus, and Marshosaurus. However, the study also reports evidence of tooth wear on these theropods that seems to indicate they were indeed contacting and biting into bone. The distribution of the bite trace occurrences also suggests that the theropods of the Morrison were preferentially feeding on juvenile sauropods, while also scavenging large sauropod carcasses. The paper encourages further studies on specific cases of sauropod bite marks in the Morrison, and it's a very nice report illustrating just how frequently these interactions between giant predators and prey were occurring. Up next in the paleontology news this week, there's also been a study that has investigated the ecological structure and diets of a community of dinosaurs in Alberta, Canada. 
This research focuses on the Oldman Formation, dating to the late Cretaceous about 76 to 77 million years ago. Looking at various element ratios and isotope values of the tooth enamel of the dinosaurs and other animals found in this formation, the researchers were able to reconstruct exactly what types of food sources these extinct creatures had been eating, and how their habitat uses differed from one another. They found signals consistent with herbivory in hadrosaurs, ceratopsians, and ankylosaurs from the formation with hadrosaurs actually feeding on higher growing plants than the ceratopsians and ankylosaurs, which makes sense considering these dinosaurs would generally have stood taller. Looking at the tyrannosaurids in the formation, as well as the mammals and lizards, the researchers also found element ratios consistent with carnivory and omnivory. The most interesting result from this study, though, is what they found with the sampled troodontids. These little theropod dinosaurs have variously been suggested to be carnivores, omnivores, or herbivores based on their unusual dentition, and the element ratios reported in this paper show that they fall between the herbivores and carnivorous dinosaurs. So the authors interpret troodontids as likely being mixed feeding to plant-dominant omnivores, a very interesting other instance of a theropod lineage apparently becoming somewhat more herbivorous then. This last week has also seen several new species of dinosaurs named, which is always very exciting. The first of these new species is a new Alvarez saurid theropod found in late Cretaceous aged rocks in Mongolia, called Jaculinicus yarui. I think. The fossil of this little dinosaur is absolutely fantastic. It's almost fully complete and articulated, and looking at the positioning of the bones relative to one another, it was realized that this dinosaur is preserved in a sleeping posture. Not only that, but the positioning, with its limbs tucked in and its tail and neck curved around, is a very bird-like sleeping position, showing that this so-called avian-like tuck-in behaviour was widespread among Maniraptoran dinosaurs, as a similar sleeping position has been seen in the Troodontids, May Long, and Cynornithoides. Not only is this a pretty adorable fossil then, but it also adds to the remarkable known diversity of Alvarez saurids in the Nemect Basin of the Gobi Desert painting a more complete picture of just how many of these little dinosaurs lived in the environments represented by the formations of this region. Jaculinicus also shows an interesting evolutionary transition among Alvarez saurids, possessing two fingers on its hands with an enlarged first digit and a reduced second, and therefore being intermediate between the condition in Shuvuia, which had three digits, two of them being very small, and Linonicus, which had just one digit. So, an incredible discovery of a remarkable fossil, providing us with a lot of new information on this lineage of dinosaurs. There have also been two new species of pachycephalosaur dinosaurs named this week as well, both in the same paper. This study reports on two isolated skull bones, one from the Dinosaur Park Formation of Alberta, and the other from the Hell Creek Formation of Montana, finding that they are similar enough to be placed in the small-bodied genus Sphyrotholus but they both also display distinct patterns of bony nodes that indicate they are both new species. As such, the Hell Creek species is named Sphyrotholus triregnum, and the dinosaur park species Sphyrotholus lyonzi. The paper explains how the pachycephalosaur fossil record is largely made up of isolated skull fragments due to these robust bones being most likely to preserve and also to be identified, while associated skeletons are very rare. But luckily, the distinct features of these bones enable paleontologists to make a lot of comparisons between known pachycephalosaur species. Not only do these two new species show that pachycephalosaurs were actually even more varied than we'd realised, diversifying all the way up until the very end of the Cretaceous period, but they also allow the evolution of the Sphyrotholus genus to be tracked, showing that two lineages diverged within this genus that had different layouts of their bony nodes. So, another very exciting dinosaur discovery this week. And before you think that's it for the new dinosaurs named this week, there's apparently yet another. This one's pretty unusual though, as it seems to have been published in a book of a collection of essays that I can't find anywhere online but lots of people are still talking about it, and so I thought I should at least mention it. The reason it's been getting attention is because this new dinosaur, a Leptoceratopsid ceratopsian, also from the late Cretaceous Oldman Formation of Alberta, has been named Gremlin Slobodorum. Based on what's being reported on its Wikipedia page, where apparently someone has had access to the paper itself, the name Gremlin refers to the small troublesome mythical creatures of the same name, while Slobodorum is in honour of Ed and Wendy Sloboda, who were involved in the fossil's discovery. It's apparently based on a single frontal bone from the skull, and that's about all I can find out about it so far. So yeah, an interesting name, and hopefully I'll be able to find the actual paper soon. And finally for this week's action-packed paleo news is another new species, 
this time a new Mosasaur. Coming from rocks dating to early on in the late Cretaceous, it's based on an almost complete skull found in northeastern Mexico. It's been assigned to the already named genus Yaguarasaurus, known from Colombia, and named as the new species Yaguarasaurus regiomontanus. This is the first occurrence of the genus in Mexico, and estimates of the total body size of this animal put it at about 5 meters in length, meaning it's one of the first large mosasaurs known. Within mosasaurs, it's specifically a plioplaticarpine, and its existence at this time early in the late Cretaceous adds to our understanding of how these marine reptiles quickly diversified and spread across the globe at this point in Earth's history. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope all our channel members have enjoyed the preview I put up of our trip to Morocco, where I've just shown some of the footage for our fossil hunting for trilobites that we did. And I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science, and we'll see you next time.